I love animals deeply. An animal, you know, or a person, they're, they're very similar. A dog that won't stop biting the mailman or you know, someone with an addiction or who can't seem to end a relationship that's hurtful to them or leave a job that they don't like, being afraid of change and fighting against your own conditioning and fighting against your own fears about doing things differently than you're used to doing them. It's a gritty, brutal love letter to dogs. The script has a dedication to Molly Millions, who is my dog. She really took care of me, um, you know, for a lot of years. Um, and I think, you know, when I was ready to be back with people, Molly moved on. Well, one of the first things they tell you at film school is never shoot with children and animals. And this movie has plenty of both. Three Presa Canarios, we had uh, a poodle, a Jack Russell, we had a Malinois, we had chickens, fish, pigeon. And that turned out to be more complicated and more difficult than, than we originally thought. We created a bunch of other units, a splinter unit, a second unit, to handle all the challenges of shooting with animals. Han Solo will do all the close-up camera work, all the gags, we call them, all the tricks. Uh, he'll be the one who stalks, or he'll be the one who interacts with the actors. Adamar will be the action double. Adamar is very safe with people as well. He'll run, you see these platforms, he'll run and jump and jump on people and stuff like this. And then we have a third dog who is not friendly. He is a, a hit dog. Everybody You're being so good. Good boy. Han is pretty special for the breed. He's unique in that his temperament is really even. He's very friendly and loves everybody. Uh, he's really fast. He's learned in just under three weeks what it would take maybe a couple months to teach most dogs. So since the day I got here, he's been living with me and uh, we hang out and uh, we share pizza and pasta and play and um, so it's, he's a good dog, he's fun. Look at the size of his treats. That's like a quarter of a meal for a little dog. What, is right there. Good boy. Ah! Stay. Stay. Now, now stay, no. Adrian and Han Solo, our main price canario, they were like really close. You want me to slate for you? It's Adrian Brody. <laughs> I, I mean, I love Han Solo, who plays De Niro. It's really funny. <laughs> He's just a great, noble, powerful creature. And I trust him, he trusts me. Adrian was very much a part of creating those scenes. So he would be calling to the animals and he would be calming Han and he would be helping. So he really was sort of an additional trainer for us. Really awesome thing to see. I mean, he weighs probably 20 pounds less than I do, so if he doesn't want to do something, I'm certainly not going to make him. Come here, boy. Walter. Walter. Come here. Ah, leave it. Leave it. Well, look at you. No. Come here, boy. Stay. Come on. Let me back him up. Sorry. Come here. No. That, that was kind of, no? It's okay. I don't know. Stay. <laughs> he died. That's okay. Hey, okay. My partner, Yariv, has a young Presa Canario puppy now that he was inspired to get, you know, in the course of this movie. Basically, there was a scene for a puppy. There were three puppies. And when we picked this puppy, it was so cute. And uh, decided why not keep him. 
Yariv is a, a nice guy and a kind person, and he will make that dog into a kind dog. If he was a, a guy like Blue who had a belief system that would allow him to, to turn that animal into something else, then that animal could become a monster. Well, no dogs have been harmed during this production. They are actually treated better than actors, I can tell you that. If we did our job correctly, that people actually considered the fact that the animals are also beings and uh, that they should be treated respectfully. That dog will have been sort of anthropomorphized. Because dogs uh, also, they, they have a say in the movie. Maybe the last, uh, no word, but the last bark. <laughs> This project uh, was brought to my attention in uh, 2009. And we started doing a pilot for this one in Belgrade, back in Belgrade. Paul had gone to Serbia actually and shot this amazing piece to kind of tell the story of what this movie is going to be like. In that short movie that we saw, you can see shots that are very light, full of life and hope, kind of an idealistic uh, world, and then something really dark. So he mixed these two uh, worlds beautifully, you know, and kind of a dichotomy. And I found it uh, unbelievably poetic. <laughs> Malkovich was the first person that came on board. We needed to find a good Stacy and went through a list of people, but then um, Brody read the script. Yes, he did. Loved it. And, okay. And he, he decided to jump on board and then sort of that kind of opened up the doors for the movie, basically. Adrian Brody and, and Joe Markovic, uh, they are actors that I, I knew. I met them before, but uh, we never had the opportunity of working together. It was uh, important for me just to be uh, around them. I love Antonio Banderas. He's uh, hilarious and irreverent and, um, and extremely intelligent. And he fires a gun like no one else. <laughs> Culkin was cast, he was actually quite a surprise. I knew we needed like someone who could stand with Titans in the gauge role. We always knew he was a good actor, but we just didn't know how good he was until we saw him in this role. Nice. And I really do believe he's one of the most exceptionally gifted young actors alive. I know working with John Malkovich and Adrian Brody, people like that, I think it's best to sort of keep quiet and just listen. I'm not asking them any questions. I'm, you know, keeping my distance, pretending like I'm not hanging on every word they say. I played a shopkeeper and uh, De Niro played De Niro. I felt like I didn't have a 
good enough backstory, so I, I spoke to the director on the day of shooting. I gave him a lot of notes on the script, you know, just shopkeeper, but where is he from and why why did we become a shopkeeper? What was so so I really rehearsed into it. I spent three weeks in a shop being a shopkeeper <laughs> uh, to get into the role, and, and I felt like I nailed it. Uh, unfortunately, they kept me out of the movie after it. This is a dream cast. I don't know if I'll ever have that experience again. I, I certainly hope so, but I'm really grateful to have had it here. It was actually on a list of the top 15 unmade scripts. Yeah, it was. And it took, I think, Paul, seven years to come to this point. Sometimes we have the tendency to think that everything has been told, or every style has been practiced, that there is nothing new to be discovered. But, uh, but there are uh, people like uh, Paul, that comes with these ideas and says, no, 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 there are other things. He's created the idea from its inception. He's not adapting uh, something else that's been conceptualized by someone else. I like the way it was written. I like what happened in the story and also the form of it. I don't know, I like the idea of it being familiar, being a sort of a dream that's happened before. Like every step I take, I felt like I've done this already. It's giving you emotion is the right one, right? And, uh, and especially when you feel like you want to reread it. Everyone was saying, great script, great script, want to see it made, but it was, wasn't until Millennium Films gave it the green light that it began to happen. I can do this. Exactly, yeah. Then I'm gonna flip back, slow it down. Yeah. Slow it down, slow it down, you come around. Okay. I'm not here to sort of impart, you know, a thesis onto an audience. Like I have my own beliefs about it and I have um, my own questions about it. Animals and people are really a product of their environment and if they've been abused, it's very difficult to unbreak that. The story is essentially three guys go to commit a robbery and they end up locked in a warehouse where strange things happen to them, let's say. The film deals with people who have a life of crime and criminal behavior, but have redeeming qualities and, and are, are stuck, are also leashed. It's almost like a poem of fatality. Life is seen by the eyes of dogs, basically guiding us through the whole entire story. This dog has been, you know, completely abused and it ends up sort of warming up to one of the characters and sort of helping that character develop and, and change. I can't stand, to be honest, I can't stand overtly happy storytelling, you know, where the, the protagonist is just set up to be such a good guy that you have to root for him. There really is no good guy. He's a guy that hides in his work, and his work just happens to be something illegal. You know, one of Stacy's principal struggles is, is with love and with romance, and that's this thing that he's stumbling his way through and failing. Couple more jobs. I'm on a plane. I won't wait. Stacy feels that it's not the moment, you know, for him to make that change. I think it's a bit the fear because he wants to. He's flawed and he's trying to figure it out, but he's a goddamn good thief. And Walker is is even even better, like a true master craftsman. My character is already an OG, but Walker is a real OG. He's my elder. He's the guy who I respect. There are only three kinds of last score, Stacy. The kind where you serve life, the kind where you're served a bullet, and the kind where you walk away. Is, is not dissimilar to our real connection as actors. People fall into orbit around him. And that kind of personal gravity, that, that's who Blue is. I think one of the things that makes him so frightening 
is that he isn't a sociopath. He has a history that made him who he is, and he's a man with a code that uh, allows him to precipitate a intense violence upon people and animals. But a man, even a stupid one, knows the difference between mine and yours. Paul, he's very methodical, excellent writer, uh, great collaborator. He likes opinion of people. He likes to, to, to test his, his opinions. I like his passion for, uh, for this work and for this story. You can tell that he has th thought about this movie for a long time before. Is very attached to the material, but can also dance with it and dance with you. So you, look, you do that, now you the camera turn to me. Assess the situation. Get back to him. You look at me. Fuck you. Look back to the dog, wrong, and then you jump. Okay, but they have the gun. No, no, don't worry about the guy. Take the gun. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Which is weird. We are in, in young directors because they have been thinking a movie for five, six years, and it's very difficult actually to move them from that uh, perception that they have on their, of their own work, and, which is normal, it's, it's natural. Uh, but uh, he listens. This project has been with me for long enough that there's some like residue, like I need to shake off old ideas and stuff that I might be stuck in. If you're lucky enough to have actors of this caliber, you would really be foolish not to enlist their participation in constructing character at every turn. And, and you can tell, actually, when you're talking with him, that you just throw an idea to him and he considers the idea, and eventually there are yes and no's. His immediate response is, just try it, let's do it. Just, just do it and, you know, we'll iron it out. If it doesn't work, we'll scrap it and try something else. So he's very collaborative. And cut! Hey guys, you feeling okay? Why aren't you in bed? You're in my eye line! <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. Um, it was very important for Paul to, to distinguish the dog's point of view. Upon arriving to, to Sofia, we basically got in touch with the Lance Master Lazar here in Boyana, and uh, he came up with the amazing uh, solutions for that. Just looking at the monitor, it was like, wow, this really kind of works. We have, we have a lot of lo different locations, and um, we had to put them somehow together. This, this whole movie takes uh, place in one location, actually, and we actually have 12 locations. We are in East, Eastern Europe, and uh, we are trying to fit our movie to be in Detroit. There are some similarities, but uh, there are a lot of dissimilarities also, you know, so... Well, Bulgaria's got a lot to offer. I mean, the, when you see the movie, there are amazing locations, but also the ease of shooting here is great. Technical teams and artistic teams here in, in, in Boyana, um, they don't have anything to envy to the best teams in the world. Hardworking, easygoing people, knowledgeable. I'm very happy here. My favorite part is the dogs. A lot of dogs walking around. I'm from New York, we have a lot of rats, but you guys got dogs, which is way better. Working atmosphere, but everything put in operational mode. I think in my seventh movie here in Bulgaria, you know, uh, I know practically everybody here. And so I, I arrive to the set and it's, hey, hey, hey. Sometimes I don't even remember what movie we were together, but I know who they are. <laughs> What I will tell the audience if they see this interview is that they are going to step into a new universe, a new territory, in which probably they are going to be surprised not only by the content of the movie, but the form and the, and the shape in which is in the, in the story is told. If you look deeply, life has got a lot of darkness, but so much beauty. And amidst one catastrophe comes another blessing. For that reason, I really like the script, and I and I wanted to make it like so bad because I think 
that message is really, really important to, to convey to people, that there is always a hope and that there is always, you can always fix it. I mean, if I could send a 20 second message to the viewers, it would be, firstly, I hope that you have a good ride. You know, I think first and foremost, like we, we set out to make a movie um, that has all of the things that, this is more than 20 seconds, isn't it? Substantially, I can't do it in 20 seconds, I'll try. I mean, I want you to have a good ride and I want you to, um, to be able to leave yourself and just let the movie wash over you. And, and um, I mean, first and foremost, I just want you to have a good time.